30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Roger all. was the voice of Jack King, the voice of Apollo, as he counted down the liftoff of Apollo 11 as it left for Cape Kennedy for the moon 50 years ago this week. And by the way, Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, started out as a GA pilot by taking flying lessons at the age of 15 in a Aronka champ and its 65 horsepower. And that was near his hometown in Wapakoneta, Ohio. Hello again, and welcome back to Aviation News Talk, a weekly show with relevant news and flying tips to help keep you safe when you fly. I'm Max Truscott. Today, we're talking about Get There-itis. It's a deadly killer that claims the lives of many GA pilots every year. I thought I would never succumb to it, but I did nearly 30 years ago and fortunately survived. I'll tell you about my story and how you can avoid Get There-itis. By the way, if you've thought about maybe someday buying a Cirrus SR-20, SR-22, or SF-50 Vision Jet, or you would like flight training in one, please contact me immediately early in that process. Call me today, 650-967-2500 for a free consultation and possibly a free demo flight. Now, last week in episode 113, we talked about aircraft electrical systems and failures. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. This week in the news, we're going to talk about a new two-place jet that you can build yourself. And the FAA is now requiring towers as low as 50 feet to be marked. And we're hearing about the possible failure of an electric aircraft company. All this and more in the news starts now. From generalaviationnews.com, new FAA regulations require landowners to mark any tower between 50 feet and 200 feet on their property, as well as include the towers in a new database the FAA is developing. Previously, towers under 200 feet were not subject to any federal marking requirements. The new requirements are due to provisions in the FAA Extension Safety and Security Act of 2016 and the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018. Under the provisions in these laws, meteorological evaluation towers, meeting the requirements stipulated in the bills, must be both marked and logged in the FAA database. Communication towers of the same size have the option to be either marked or logged in the FAA database. Officials with the National Agricultural Aviation Association encourage landowners to preemptively mark their towers and voluntarily log towers on their property into the FAA's Daily Digital Obstacle File. That's the Daily DOF. The Daily DOF is an obstacle database that contains mostly obstructions above 200 feet, with obstructions below 200 feet being submitted on a voluntary basis. An NAAA analysis of accidents from 2008 to 2018 across all sectors of general aviation found there were 40 tower-related accidents and incidents resulting in 36 fatalities. The data also show many of these GA aviators did not collide with the main body of the obstruction itself, but the extremely difficult to see guy wires supporting the structure. From a safety perspective, being transparent about the existence of low-level obstacles is vital to ag pilots and other aircraft flying in the airspace between 0 and 400 feet, such as police and first responder aircraft, aerial firefighters, and pipeline patrol pilots, NAAA officials said. And we had one of those accidents here just a few years ago on uh, Bethel Island, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area. An ag pilot hit a tower which was uh, under 200 feet, and it had been erected there by a wind turbine company to try and determine where to place a new wind turbine. Now, wind turbine companies have generally avoided reporting locations that are towers so that the competition won't be aware of where they're looking to place new wind turbines. From FlyingMag.com, Sonics revealed development of a new two-seat version of their subsonic single-engine jet, and more details will be revealed soon. 
The new JSX-2T is being billed by the Oshkosh, Wisconsin company as an ideal trainer for the single-place JSX-2, and of course, the perfect tour for those who want to share the unique experience of jet-powered flight in a light aircraft. The JSX-2T is configured with side-by-side seating for optimum center of gravity placement and offers a superior training environment for pilots. With a wingspan of 21.8 feet, the JSX-2T will have similar wing loading and handling characteristics as the single-place JSX-2, as well as the same proven PBS TJ-100 turbojet engine. An optional, more powerful PBS TJ-150 engine will also be offered. Sonics will hold an open house event in the lead-up to the EAA Air Venture on Sunday, July 21st at 10 a.m. to provide more details about the JSX-2T, including its projected development timeline and how customers can get in line to purchase their own two-place subsonics. The event will be held at the Sonics factory headquarters at Whitman Regional Airport in Oshkosh the day before Air Venture. Also, a forum focused on the JSX-2T will be held at Air Venture on Wednesday, July 24th on Stage 5 at 11.30 a.m. The Subsonics personal jet aircraft first began development in 2009. It is now being sold around the world as the most popular and affordable kit jet aircraft. Subsonics JSX-2 kit engine and completion cost started under $114,000. Sonic said the target price for the Subsonics JSX-2T is under $140,000. From AOPA.org, the FAA notes compliance exceptions for ADSB airspace. The FAA has issued a policy statement that explains circumstances when operators of aircraft equipped to comply with ADSB out will avoid enforcement for technical failures that are outside their control. The policy statement published in the Federal Register does not offer blanket absolution for failure to comply with ADSB equipage and performance requirements. It spells out a clear framework for forgiveness, making it clear that operators who are notified of consistent and repeated noncompliance should not expect a free ride. To be considered not responsible for a degradation of GPS performance that violates the ADSB rule, the aircraft operator must have exercised appropriate due diligence prior to conducting an operation. Operators who encounter GPS interference, which has been a focus of AOPA advocacy efforts to mitigate the flight safety risk, would not be held responsible for a GPS performance failure resulting in non-compliance. The FAA added that an aircraft operator should proceed with a proposed flight if a planned GPS interference event would be the only expected impediment to complying, noting that requiring operators to avoid the affected area would cause significant disruption to air traffic in that vicinity. Furthermore, there is no guarantee that these operators would experience actual interference and a degradation in GPS performance in the area. If a signal degradation did occur, the aircraft's broadcast data would notify air traffic control, which would control the aircraft using a backup strategy. Now, AOPA has vigorously advocated for relief from the widespread and increasing planned GPS interference events that are a necessary part of military training, but often affect vast areas of navigable airspace. While the FAA and the military investigate solutions to the loss of navigation signal hazard for GA, AOPA has advised GA pilots that as a stopgap measure, when in-flight loss of GPS reception degrades flight safety, the pilot in command should notify ATC to stop buzzer, a phrase used to immediately halt a GPS interference activity. Now, I've read elsewhere that if you were having issues uh, with navigation when your GPS goes out because of this interference, you should declare an emergency with ATC and state what is happening And then it's up to ATC management to determine if the situation is a stop buzzer event, in which case they will relay a message to suspend the interference testing. From FlyMag.com, G1000 NXI retrofits come to more piston aircraft. Pilots who fly with Garmin's latest G1000 NXI integrated flight deck know the truth. Once you go NXI, you'll never want to go back. The upgraded version of the original G-1000 flight deck is offered in a long list of new GA aircraft and is quickly making its mark in the retrofit market as well. Now Garmin has added five Cessna and Beechcraft models to the list of airplanes that are eligible for retrofit upgrade to the G-1000 NXI at a price that some aircraft buyers will find appealing. Aircraft owners can soon upgrade to the G-1000 NXI in the Cessna 172, 182, and 206 and Beechcraft Bonanza and Baron if the airplane is already equipped with a WASP-capable G-1000 integrated flight deck. And just as an aside, 
I know that uh, any of the Cessna aircraft 2007 and later are WAS uh, capable. The NXI upgrade offers faster processors, a long list of enhanced features, and sharper displays that add up to a clear improvement over the legacy G1000 system that's been installed in many thousands of GA airplanes over the years. Garmin expects deliveries of the G1000 NXI for Cessna and Beechcraft to begin next month. The upgrade carries a list price of $28,995 and is available for purchase through Garmin authorized dealers. The upgrade components come with a two-year warranty. And they list some features here with the G1000 NXI. Customers experience faster performance and find tremendous value in new features like wireless cockpit connectivity, visual approach guidance, and surface watch. The NXI system also brings upgraded and dual-core processors that provide smoother panning and faster map rendering. And I must say, I really like the visual approaches that you can now load and fly just like any other instrument approach. From verticalmag.com, the 13th Annual Electric Aircraft Symposium lands in Oshkosh. Dozens of the world's leading electric aircraft developers and technology experts will be speaking at the Comparative Aircraft Flight Efficiency, or CAFE, Foundation's 13th Annual Electric Aircraft Symposium at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh on July 20th to 21st, the weekend prior to the EAA's Air Venture 2019. The CAFE Foundation and Vertical Flight Society have been working to advance electric aviation for many years and have partnered again for this year's event. Electric and hybrid electric powered aircraft have the potential to significantly reduce air transportation cost, carbon emissions, and community noise. Quote, the electric powered aircraft industry is gaining momentum and the symposium provides an opportunity to get a comprehensive brief on the state of the industry and meet the top leaders before EAA Air Venture begins said Yolanka Wolf, executive director of the nonprofit CAFE Foundation. In 2007, CAFE Foundation organized the world's first electric aircraft symposium to address emerging interest in electric propulsion, along with energy and climate issues. These meetings help create the industry you see today. Registration for the 13th Annual Electric Aircraft Symposium can be found on the CAFE Foundation's website at www.cafe.foundation. No .com or .org on that. It just ends in .foundation. From generalaviationnews.com, text messaging has been added to AirVenture arrival procedures. A new text message system will add further information for pilots as they prepare their arrivals at AirVenture Oshkosh 2019 using the FAA's NOTAM procedures. The text message availability is one of several enhancements to the NOTAM process for AirVenture. By texting OSH ARRIVAL, so O-S-H-A-R-R-I-V-A-L, to 64600, pilots can receive the latest status updates for air venture arrivals and plan accordingly, whether that means continuing to Oshkosh or perhaps temporarily stopping at an outlying airport if traffic levels are very high, EAA officials said. The NOTAM, which is in effect from 6 a.m. Central Time on Friday the 19th of July until noon Central Time on July 29th, outlines procedures for the many types of aircraft that fly to Oshkosh for the event, as well as aircraft that land at nearby airports. The new Osh Arrival text message system is in addition to two long-standing AirVenture text message systems, Osh Alert, which provides AirVenture site weather and other updates, and Osh Fun, which provides AirVenture feature and highlights. Each of the three text messages systems can be obtained by texting that specific term to 64600. And finally, from the SeattleTimes.com, Bothell-based electric aircraft startup Zunum runs out of cash. Zunum, the Bothell-based startup developing a small hybrid electric airplane, has run out of cash and much of the operation has collapsed. The company promised to develop a family of small jets to serve lucrative short-hop routes with on-demand air taxi services. A graphic produced by the company showed three different electric aircraft flying over Seattle, a 10-seat plane, a 50-seat plane, and a 100-seat airliner. Credibility of the company's Silicon Valley-style pitch for a technology shift that would transform aviation was boosted by investments from Boeing and JetBlue. But unless new investors step forward, that fanciful dream is dead. Department of Commerce spokesperson Penny Thomas said that Zoom had projected the total cost of the project at $36.9 million. It's unclear if the company founders or others put in any money before the Boeing and JetBlue investments. According to a detailed account of Zoom's failure in Forbes, the company laid off nearly all of its 70-person staff in November. Forbes reported that Zunum has vacated the Bothell headquarters space, as well as its Indianapolis facilities, 
and creditors have seized its electric motor equipment that was under development in Elgin, Illinois. There are two outstanding unpaid wage complaints against Azunum with the Illinois Department of Labor. The spokesman for Boeing said it's currently taking a more passive approach to our relationship with Zunim. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, my weekly updates. And then we'll get on to our main topic of get their itis and how to avoid it. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now, let me give you a few quick updates. First of all, if you've just found the show, if you would, please go ahead and click on the subscribe button. It doesn't cost anything, but what it does do is help boost our rankings a little bit as we get more new subscribers. So please click on that subscribe button in whatever app you might be listening to us on. And of course, I played that clip from the Apollo 11 moonshot at the beginning of the program. I just want to talk briefly about a couple of the astronauts that I have met over the years, and both of them had been on the Apollo program. By the way, just uh, if you were not alive in the 1960s, I have to tell you that it was a remarkable time for those of us who were following the Apollo space program. I think that virtually everybody in the country was glued to the television, was reading the newspaper feverishly. We were all looking for every little scrap of information we could get about the program. It really captivated the nation. It was one of those moments where I think the nation was truly united. And it is very memorable uh, thinking back to that period of time. Well, roll forward to the early 1990s. And something called Space Camp opened up that uh, was located at the NASA Ames facility here in Mountain View, California. And that wasn't part of NASA Ames. It just happened to be co-located on their uh, property there. And uh, shortly after they opened in the early 90s, I went and spent uh, a long weekend with one of my daughters, my older daughter. And that was within a month or two after they opened. And it turned out that that was the same weekend they had their grand opening. So I guess they postponed it till after it had been open for a couple of months. Now, it wasn't terribly crowded at that grand opening, so I found myself at one point uh, that I was the only person standing there talking with Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard was one of the original uh, seven Mercury 7 astronauts, and he lived uh, here in the Monterey Bay area in Northern California for some time after the space program. And he was just one of 12 astronauts who actually was able to walk on the moon. Well, shortly after that, a gentleman walked up next to us and started talking with Alan, and I stood there and listened. And he said, Alan, I understand that you were the first person to hit a golf ball on the moon. And (laughs) Alan kind of looked at him seriously and said fairly uh, stoically and uh, slowly, well, actually, I think I was the only one to ever hit a golf ball on the moon. (laughs) Yeah, it was pretty funny. And the other gentleman, of course, laughed. So I'll always remember that uh, brief conversation with uh, Alan Shepard. Then perhaps a year later, maybe two years later, again, sometime in the early uh, 90s, I was there with my youngest daughter, and they had yet another open house. And who do they have but Wally Shira, also one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, who also flew one of the Apollo missions. Now, he was a real friendly guy, and I tried to ask him a couple serious questions, because I was just kind of curious about things related to the program. I don't know what it was that I asked, but I remember very clearly that he brushed both of my questions off with kind of a laugh or with some joking words. So I was surprised that I just couldn't get a serious answer out of him. He, of course, did have a reputation as a jokester, and I certainly saw that. Now, the other brush with the Apollo program I had was sometime around 1997, and that's when I met Gene Krantz under totally different circumstances. Now, you may remember him. He was the chief flight director who directed missions for both the Gemini program and the Apollo programs, including the first lunar landing mission, Apollo 11. Now, he was also the flight director for Apollo 13, which, of course, if you've seen the movie, you know that that was a very challenging mission where they had failures in space and just barely brought the astronauts home using a lot of ingenuity. And, of course, the quote, failure is not an option, has been attributed to him. I saw him on an airliner as we were flying from LAX to uh, Palm Springs. I was headed down for a Hewlett Packard event. I was a major accounts manager and I was going with some of the executives from the major account I was responsible for down to an event that HP was holding. Uh, I recall that Lou Platt, our CEO, was down there as well. And so as I climbed out of the airliner, I knew that uh, Gene was going to be the keynote speaker and I walked past him in the aisle and I said, oh, are you Gene Krantz? (laughs) He said yes. And so we talked for a couple of minutes on the the airplane. Of course, then uh, It was a large crowd of people, and I didn't get a chance to chat with him after we got to the event in Palm Springs. I do remember it was held at a polo grounds, 
And the most bizarre thing was after uh, the polo games, there was golf cart polo. So I remember being on a golf cart with a, a, a club you know, trying to hit uh, golf balls from the cart. But of course, the most memorable thing about the entire program was watching the uh, astronauts walk on the moon. And that was 1969. I was 12 years old. And I was on the East Coast, so we had to stay up till 2, 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> I remember watching a little bit, but also falling asleep uh, multiple times while, while watching that. So amazing program back from the, uh, the 1960s. And I certainly hope we uh, recapture some of that uh, in the future. Let's see. Let's talk about some more earthly kinds of things. Air Venture, I've mentioned that I won't be there. And we're not going to have a dedicated uh, episode of the podcast this year for Air Venture. But I know there are folks out there who are very interested in it. So if you are, let me refer you to two podcasts that are covering Air Venture in detail. One would be Airplane Geeks episode 558, in which we interviewed Dick Knipsky, who is the Director of Communications for EAA. So you can hear all about what's planned at this year's show. And this week on Opposing Bases episode 81, they dedicated the show to talking about the Air Venture Notum, which is an extremely long document that tells you all the procedures you need to follow if you're going to be flying your aircraft into Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Oh, and speaking of opposing bases, I was the guest on episode 80 last week, and I was talking about the airspace here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So if you have any interest in learning about uh, how to navigate through the complexities of the Class Bravo, the different flyways we have, and some of the things that you can see while flying the Bay Tour, go ahead and check out opposing bases episode number 80, and I've got a link to that in the show notes. And I want to give a, a quick shout out to uh, FedEx and to uh, Captain Robin Sabasco. Boy, what a great thing uh, Robin and FedEx did. You may have heard earlier this month that there was uh, a young lady, 18 years old, Elizabeth Little, who went by the nickname Lake. She unfortunately crashed while doing touch and goes as part of her flight training to become a, a private pilot, and she died. She crashed on the Old Miss uh, Golf Course, which of course is down in uh, Mississippi where she lived. Her aspiration was to become a pilot and to fly for FedEx, and unfortunately her life was cut short, so she'd never be able to do that. But Captain uh, Robin Sabasco sent a letter, which I have a copy of here, and he wrote it to her parents and uh, her siblings, and it says, On behalf of the 5,000 pilots of FedEx, I'd like to offer our sincerest, deepest sympathies in your time of grief. A fellow captain at FedEx made me aware of Lake's desire to fly with us someday. While we will never have that privilege, I wanted to reach out and let you know she was on the right track pursuing a dream centered around love for aviation, which few people can fully understand. As her family, I know you did understand, and I know that professional pilots around the globe would join me in applauding her love for flying. Her courage, determination, and persistence were the exact qualities that make the best pilots. And it's with deep regret I learned of her accident, as her loss is a loss for all aviators. My kindest personal regards, Robin Sabasco, Captain of FedEx Express, Managing Director of Flight Operations, and System Chief Pilot. And in the letter, Captain Sabasco included a set of FedEx pilot wings that Lake would have worn uh, if she had eventually gotten a job with FedEx. So anyway, hats off to uh, Captain Sabasco and to uh, FedEx. And let me also give a quick shout out posthumously to my good friend, Daryl Kothoff, who I just learned yesterday died at home of a possible heart attack. He was a really good friend and fellow CFI, uh, and I mention that because I know that somewhere somebody is listening today who has flown with him in the past. Daryl was 50 years old, and he was just, of course, way too young to die. He was a career flight instructor. He graduated from the San Jose State University Aviation Program in 1994. Got to tell you, he always had one of the fullest schedules. That guy was flying 24-7. He was always cheerful, extremely passionate, and very professional in his approach to flight instruction, Probably the thing I liked most about him was in our monthly flight instructor meetings, he would be the one guy who would always bring up whatever the elephant in the room was, whatever it might be. He would just relentlessly pursue whatever topic it was, you know, to the point where I know that sometimes I think he left the flight school management just a little bit uncomfortable. But Daryl, you are going to be sorely missed. So for anyone who is a CFI or is thinking about becoming a CFI, I hope you follow your inner Daryl and uh, we can all try and be a little bit more like him. Daryl, I'm going to miss you, buddy. And let me quickly mention a message that I received from Facebook Messenger. I want to thank Okieri Obed for writing to me. He's from Ghana. He said, I really like your podcast, Often Stuff. You inspire me to be a career flight instructor. Well, Okieri, there's one more opening now that Daryl has passed away. So hope you step up and fill that opening real soon. 
And I also want to quickly mention a video that I shot last week and posted on Facebook as well as YouTube. And it's all about emergency descents. So an aviation writer who we've actually had on this show sent me an email asking me about emergency descents in the Cirrus, which are different than you may have been taught in a Cessna or Piper. Often on those aircraft, pilots are taught to put in full flaps, bank uh, 45 degrees, and then spiral down to the ground. Emergency descents, by the way, would be if you absolutely have to be on the ground now. So imagine a fire in flight or you know some type of severe medical emergency. If you need to get down immediately, emergency descent is the way to get down. In the Cirrus, it's really quite simple. It's By the way, it's also the same in most jets, and it's also the same in the Columbia 400 or Cessna TTX. Essentially, you just pull the throttle all the way back, point the nose down about 15, maybe 20 degrees, and then just do not exceed VNE, which is in the SR-20, which I shot the video in, would be uh, 200 knots. So we got the nose down to about minus 15 degrees pitch in the uh, video, and the aircraft only accelerated to about 155 knots, but it had already reached 4,000 feet per minute. So if you want to check out that video, I'll include a link to it in the show notes. Now, well, let me quickly mention a few ways that you can support the show. I'm sure longtime listeners know that you can either go out to our Patreon site, or these days you can go to PayPal. For example, our $4 a month supporters get copies of the scripts for all these new shows, and the $8 a month supporters get the scripts plus a link to all the stories that we didn't cover in the news because of time constraints. And this week, I think we had nine stories that didn't make it into the news. Now, we also have a large number of super supporters who donate $20 a month, and all of them are listed in the show notes every time that we post on Patreon after every show. So let me thank our new Patreon supporters who joined us in the last couple of weeks. They include uh, Carl Kleiderer, Philip Howe, Fred Canavan, who's a new super supporter, Kevin Wells, and Raul Casas Doles. Now, we also have a small number of uh, mega supporters, these five supporters who donate more than $50 a month, and I try and mention them every show that we have a new show, and they also will receive a book from me after two months as a mega supporter, and they are Tyson Weiss, co-founder of Flight, Victor Vogel, who lives in central PA and flies a Cirrus, Tim Delaney, who's flying for nearly 50 years and flies an SR-22 in Northern California, Stephen Elop, who flies a Turbo 182 and a Citation M2, and Larry Noe from New York, New York, who uh, used to fly a Bonanza G36, but has just picked up a new SR-22. Now, you can also support us through PayPal by going out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal, and you can either make a one-time contribution or a regular monthly contribution. So if you would, head on out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome to reach our Patreon site, or go to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal if you'd like to make a donation. Now, in a moment, we're going to talk about get Itis right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let's talk about get there itis. It's also known as get home itis or sometimes even press on itis. But if you're not familiar with the term, it's a combination of the words get there and the suffix itis, I T I S, which means a disease often characterized by inflammation. And if you go to Wikipedia, it actually defines get there itis and says that it's an aviation term. That means, quote, the determination of a pilot to reach a destination, even when conditions for flying are very dangerous. Now, the name get there itis may seem funny as it's a rather clever combination of words, or even you might think it's a non-serious topic. But all pilots need to understand that it's a real phenomena, even if it's largely psychological, but that it can affect any of us, no matter how experienced we are, and that it can have deadly consequences. And here's where we're going to go with the topic today. I'm going to tell you a couple of real-life stories about get there itis, including a time it happened to me. I'll also talk about the one study I could find on the topic that just quantifies how serious a problem this is. And then I'll talk about some tips that you can use to help reduce the chance of getting get there itis when you're flying. Now, I started thinking about this after I posted a story on Facebook last week that got far more comments than most stories I post. The post was a link to an article that had been published in a newspaper about a family that crashed and died in 2017 in Colorado. And the final NTSB report for that accident had just been published, which prompted the newspaper to write about the accident. And I think my post drew so many comments for a couple reasons. First, the article included just a beautiful picture of the family that died in the crash. In it, you can see a picture of the mom and the dad standing next to each other. And their two children, a boy and girl who actually were twins, were standing in front of them. And I'm guessing the photo was taken at a wedding as the family is outdoors. They're standing at the base of some stairs. And in the background, you can see seating for perhaps 100 people. The seats are long, wide boards. 
and each one of the boards is mounted atop several two-foot chunks of a large tree trunk. And in front of all that seating, it looks like there's a gazebo where wedding ceremonies might be performed. Now, the kids look like they might be seven or eight years old in the photo, and they're very well-dressed. The boy is wearing a suit jacket and a green tie, and the girl has on a white dress and flowers in her hair as if maybe she had been the flower girl at the wedding that day. So it's really a lovely family picture taken during what must have been a fun day for the family. So certainly the photo really caught people's attention. But what I think caught their attention even more was just how senseless their deaths were and just totally avoidable. I'll talk more about the details of that accident and how easy it would have been to avoid because it looks like a classic case of get there itis. But first, if you're like me, you have undoubtedly heard of get there itis and you read about it many times in pilot magazines. And maybe like me, at some point, you were absolutely convinced that since you know about get there itis, it couldn't ever possibly happen to you. And certainly, for many years, I was totally convinced that I could never get get there itis until I nearly had a fatal accident with my daughter on board, which I attribute to a very bad case of get there itis. And I'll tell you about that incident in a few minutes. Now, lest you think that get there itis only happens to GA pilots, here's a story I found about a pair of 737 pilots that destroyed their brand new aircraft. And this comes from PICMA.info, and I have a link to it in the show notes. Now, they had a different name for get there itis that I really like. They called it plan continuation bias. And here's what they say. A frequent factor in accidents is that the conditions actually encountered are very different to those anticipated, particularly worse weather. And by the way, this is just a common theme in most of the GA get their accidents uh, that I read about. Now, they say both crew members may have shared the same overly optimistic mental model and have difficulty switching from trying to resolve short-term problems to seeing that the big picture was unsatisfactory. In other words, they became preoccupied with struggling with the alligators when the objective was to drain the swamp. And it continues, a related influence is planned continuation bias, or in ordinary language, get their itis. In essence, that means that having started out with one idea in mind, e.g., we have thought it through and we'll be able to land, it's very difficult to recognize that changed circumstances have actually undermined that plan's validity. Humans have a natural tendency both to look for and accept information which quickly confirms what they already believe and also to reject any information that contradicts it. And as just a quick aside, I think psychologists call that confirmation bias. And continuing on here, an extreme example of planned continuation bias may have resulted in the destruction of a brand new 737, which had just a total of a 143 hours on it in 2013 after a traditional non-precision approach. The weather information on which the crew had based their plan was 10 kilometer visibility, nil weather, few cumulus clouds, scattered 1,700 feet. But in fact, there was a significant thunderstorm shower on short final with very degraded visibility and heavy rain. And it says, having given his uh, first officer the sector, that is the takeoff and the landing, the captain was the pilot monitoring. At 900 feet, a single light was seen through haze and rain, but not more. At the decision altitude of 465 feet, The captain had acquired some visual reference, but the pilot flying had not, and a missed approach should have then been initiated. Instead, the pilot monitoring the captain instructed the pilot flying to continue descending. The pilot flying said he still had no visual reference, but disconnected the autopilot and the aircraft descended further into heavy rain. Neither pilot now had adequate visual or adequate instrument reference. At 150 feet, the captain took over control, but instead of going around, he continued descending, expecting to see the runway after passing through the rain. At 20 feet above the ground, as measured by the radar altimeter, he finally called go-around, but by then it was far too late. The aircraft struck the water and was destroyed, fortunately without loss of life. Unfortunately, the basic plan or mental model used in most airline operations is not fail-safe. The almost universal basic plan is to, quote, fly an approach and make a visual landing, unless a go-around is needed. Of course, this works 99.9% of the time. But from an air safety viewpoint, the unless is the weak point in the chain, as keep going to make a visual landing is the default. Plan continuation or any other failure to adhere to the criteria for unless a go-around is needed can only make the situation hazardous. Now, they explain this a little better here. They say, the normal mental model for air transport approaches needs to be reversed and become fly an approach and go around unless a visual can be made. And by the way, that's a perfectly good model for all GAA pilots to make all their landings. So I'll just go ahead and read that again. You want to fly an approach and go around unless a visual landing could be made. So on every landing, 
think of it as a go around unless everything looks good, in which case you'll then land. The article says the plan is then fail safe as it's biased toward a go around. Even though the fail safe is needed on only a minute proportion of actual occasions, in principle, this precaution is no different to that taken prior to every takeoff when the crew briefs on the actions for an even more improbable event, an engine failure during takeoff. Now, when I talk about accidents on this show, I like to look for studies that have been done on a topic. And sure enough, I did find one, but only one study that's been done on get there itis. And this comes from BEA.ero, which is the Bureau d'Enquête d'Analysis pour la Sécurité de l'Aviation Civile. <laughs> My French is not that great, but I believe that's the equivalent of their NTSB. I think that's the Investigations and Analysis for the Safety of Civil Aviation Department. Uh, this study, which they called Get Home Itis Syndrome, analyzed accidents that occurred between 1991 and 1996, where pilots were trying to reach their destination at all cost. For this study, the BEA database was consulted and certain accidents were selected. Accidents which occurred in France to French or foreign aircraft flying under VFR flight rules at the time of the accident, in general aviation, and in which a very strong desire on the part of the crew to reach their destination was observed. The criteria used to quantify this was fascination with the objective, and they say that's directly linked with the motivation for the trip, such as a trip planned a long time in advance, need to get to a professional meeting, etc. Study covers a period 1991 to 96, during which 60 accidents corresponded to these criteria. Among these accidents, 40 were fatal and caused the death of 100 people. And they say in an average year between 1991 and 96 in GA, there were 265 accidents and 48 fatalities in accidents of all types. Now, this is in France. The accidents analyzed represent 4.5% of the total number of accidents in an average year. These accidents, which resulted from the desire of the pilot to reach their destination at all cost, caused 41% of the total deaths in general aviation. So think about that. In these get-home-itis accidents, they were only about 5% of the total accidents, but they were over 40% of all the deaths. And they say in flight, the pilot can be confronted with three types of problems that may occur singly or in combination. And they are insufficient fuel, unfavorable meteorological environment, or poor lighting conditions such as nighttime. Decision-making is a complex process that depends on the diagnosis of the situation and the evaluation of possible solution. This must obviously be done under pressure of time. And by the way, let me add this perspective right here. Your decision-making doesn't need to be under the pressure of time if you're doing all that decision-making before takeoff. So instead of being under pressure in the air trying to make these decisions, you really should try to make all of your analysis on the ground. That's where you need to be making your go-no-go -no -go planning when you're not under time pressure. But I got to tell you, I am often rushed before doing a big trip. And so I find sometimes I'm even on the ground under pressure to try and make these decisions because I've been busy up to the last minute trying to finish up other things. So I realize it's a challenge. And continuing, they say in flight and marginal situations, decisions are often made under stress. Stress can stimulate judgment, but may also, when excessively, to false or inhibited decision making. Fatigue accumulated during a long flight can also alter decision making. And to that, I will add hypoxia. If the pilots have been flying at high altitude, that's certainly going to hinder your decision making. Now, here's a key discovery from the study that I found really interesting. They said that the closer a pilot was to their destination, that is, you know, they've flown a higher percentage of the trip, the more likely they were to have an accident. So perhaps pilots are more likely to continue flying into poor conditions when they get close to their destination because they figure, well, if they can just get through that one little challenge They'll have succeeded in their goal of trying to get to their destination. So keep that in mind. The closer you get to your destination, the more likely you are to come to get their itis. Now, the study wraps up by saying that good flight preparation comes from good knowledge of the aircraft. And I always say, by the way, that the goal of a pilot is mastery of the airplane. So you want to know everything there is to know about your aircraft. Also, gathering the appropriate documentation to perform the flight, a close study of the complete weather, precise calculation of the fuel, and correct flight planning. And in addition, this preparation will also allow the pilot to make the right decision in the right place, which they say is on the ground. And my friend Rod Machado has long said that the best decisions you make are the ones that you make on the ground. Because when you're up there in the air, you tend to make uh, poor decisions. Now, let's go back to the accident I mentioned at the beginning of the segment, the one that drew so many comments on Facebook about that family of four that died in Colorado. Here's what the NTSB report says on that crash, and I'll have a link to it in the show notes. According to family members, the pilot's initial plan was 
to depart for CNY, that's Moab, Utah, about 1530 or about 330 local time. However, a business issue resulted in delayed departure. The actual departure was nearly four hours later at 7.20 p.m. local, which was 11 minutes after local sunset time. On September 15th, 2017, about uh, 2010 Mountain Daylight Time, so that would be about 40 minutes later, Cirrus SR-22, November 462, Sierra Romeo, impacted trees and mountainous terrain while maneuvering near Glenwood Springs, Colorado. The non-instrument-rated private pilot and three passengers were fatally injured, and the airplane was destroyed. Night IMC conditions prevailed at the time of the accident, and a VFR flight plan had been filed for the personal cross-country flight, which left from the Fort Collins Loveland Municipal Airport about 7.20 and was destined for the Canyonlands Field Airport in Moab, Utah. By the way, as an aside, I'll mention that Moab was the airport that my client departed from just before his fatalizing accident in late May. According to ATC information from the FAA, the pilot was receiving flight following services during the flight. Radar track indicated the airplane departed and traveled on a southwesterly heading toward the destination. At 7.25, the pilot stated to the controller that he was going to climb the airplane to 15,000 feet to, quote, get over the mountains and then back down again. Now, I should mention, this was an older SR-22, which does not come from the factory with oxygen installed, though it's possible the pilot had an oxygen bottle. But if he did, the SR-22 POH says that bottle must be strapped to the co-pilot's seat, which would have been impossible unless the mother and two children were all sitting in the back, which would have been illegal since there are only two seatbelts in the back of the older SR-22s. At 7.28, the airplane turned on a southwesterly direct heading to Moab at an indicated altitude of 10,700 feet. By 7.32, the airplane had climbed to 13,200 feet and stopped climbing. From 7.40 to 8 o'clock, radar data showed the airplane on a southwest heading with a series of altitude changes between 13,200 and 10,500 feet. At 8.04, about 10 miles northeast of Glenwood Springs, Colorado, the plane turned to the northwest at an altitude of 11,500 and continued northwest for about 12 miles. At 8.08, a passenger sent a text message to her mother, taking the long way around, lots of weather, keep you posted. For the next minute, the airplane was in a gradual left turn to the southwest. The last recorded radar return was at 9 minutes after 8 o'clock at an altitude of 11,400 feet and about a quarter mile south of the accident site. The flight was likely operating in IMC at the time of the accident, including light to moderate icing conditions. The airplane likely encountered intermittent IMC beginning about 30 minutes after takeoff and continued into an area of solid IMC about three minutes before the accident occurred. Now, think about that, three minutes. You may have heard of the uh, study that was done in the video called 178 Seconds to Live, which is almost exactly three minutes That's the average amount of time that private pilots survived in a simulator when they were put into IMC conditions. The report here says that satellite imagery around the time of the accident was reviewed and indicated cloud cover over the accident site with cloud cover moving from the southwest to the northeast. At 8.15, the approximate cloud top heights were 22,000 feet over the accident site. Of course, it was night, so it would be impossible to see those clouds. The night IMC conditions present at the time of the accident were conducive to the development of spatial disorientation and the circumstances of the accident. The non-instrument rated pilots continued flying into IMC. The airplane's descending turn depicted on radar and the fragmentation of the wreckage due to high energy impact are all consistent with the known effects of a loss of control due to spatial disorientation. It's likely that while maneuvering, the pilot experienced spatial disorientation, which resulted in a loss of control and subsequent descent into terrain. In the NTSB, so the probable cause was the non-instrument rate of pilot's inadequate pre-flight weather planning, his decision to depart and to forecast IMC along the route of flight, and his continued visual flight into IMC, which resulted in spatial disorientation and a subsequent loss of airplane control. Now, the report also says that a review of FAA records revealed that the pilot obtained his private certificate on March 1, 2017, which would have been an exactly six and a half months before his crash. He did not hold an instrument rating. The logbook revealed he had accumulated 2.4 hours in simulated instrument conditions. The airplane was a 2007 Cirrus SR-22, and it was registered to the pilot in February of 2016, about a year before he got his private, so it's likely that much of his flight training was done in that aircraft as a student pilot. The pilot had a total of 303 hours, of which 257 hours were in the same make and model as the accident aircraft. 
Now you might ask, what makes this a get there itis accident? Well, first of all, September 15th was a Friday, so the beginning of the weekend. Moab, Utah is a popular tourist destination, so it seems entirely likely the family was traveling there for a weekend outing. And the original article I posted from Facebook, which was from the Colorado Sun, uh, was talking about the family. Their name, by the way, is Makepeace. That was their last name. It said, an obituary for the family said the Makepeace family was known for their adventurous spirits and their love of all things outdoors. They were always on the go, whether it be hiking up Horsetooth Mountain, skiing in steamboat, or flying to be with family for a weekend adventure, it read. Now, there are just countless others of these kinds of Friday evening accidents that occur because pilots started too late and the flight that they thought would be in the daytime ended up at night, or they continued into bad weather, or both. One that comes to mind is the JFK Jr. accident, which coincidentally happened this week exactly 20 years ago. He was a private pilot working on his instrument rating. That flight was delayed, and he took off much later than planned at night, and he ended up in hazy conditions over Long Island Sound, with the lights on the water below probably blended with the stars in the sky, making it just about impossible for a private pilot to know where the horizon was located unless they were extremely good at using their instruments. He became disoriented and quickly lost control of the aircraft, which plunged into the water. Now, many people, including me, believe that if he had used his autopilot, which that airplane had, you probably wouldn't have had the accident. Now, closer to home here in California, I remember a family that took off from San Jose in a Piper Saratoga bound for Las Vegas, and they left on a Saturday morning, and it was just a few days before Christmas in 2015. They encountered bad weather, and the pilot asked for an IFR clearance, even though he wasn't instrument rated. That flight broke up in flight, killing a family of five. And then back in 2011, about 7.30 p.m. on a Saturday night in July, a new private pilot killed his family of four while taking off from Watsonville, California, in a Mooney. Now, Watsonville is right next to the Pacific Ocean, and there was a low deck of clouds approaching the departure end of the runway. And in his haste to outclimb those clouds, he pulled the aircraft up into a stall, and it spun in just barely off the airport property. Their destination was Groveland, California, which is right next to Yosemite National Park, where they were probably headed for the weekend. And that pilot, yeah, he'd been licensed for less than four months. So, are you seeing a pattern here? Non-instrument rated pilots who have relatively low time, taking their family on weekend trips, leaving late, flying at night, flying in poor weather conditions, and of course, the people dying, yeah, the pilot and their loved ones. So you have to ask, what motivates an otherwise rational pilot to make decisions that ultimately kill their entire family? I mean, think about that for a moment. Why would you engage in behavior that kills your own family? I mean, the only conclusion I can reach is that get there itis is a powerful force that can overwhelm a pilot's normally rational decision-making. Or that some pilots are uninformed and they truly don't understand the high risk they're taking by pressing on at night, into clouds, into mountains, into icing, or some combination of that. I mean, if these pilots truly understood these risks, I don't think they'd be putting their family into harm's way by pressing on into dangerous conditions solely because they were trying to meet a schedule or commitment to be somewhere at a certain time. Now, let me talk about my brush with get there 29 years ago and how a little luck, and that's really all it was, it was just pure luck, kept me from dying in an aircraft with my then three-year-old daughter. Now, this was in 1992, and I'd had my private pilot certificate for 15 years, though my total time was right around 300 hours. Now, that works out to be less than 20 hours per year on average after I got my private, and it's not surprising. During that time, I finished my last three years of college. I got my first job working for Hewlett Packard in New Jersey. I got married. I got my MBA from NYU. I had two kids. And I moved to California four years before the flight. So it was a really busy time in my life. And I wasn't flying as much as I would have liked. Fortunately, though, I had an instrument rating, which I'd finished about two years before the incident. Now, my brother-in-law lived in Carefree, Arizona, which is just north of Scottsdale. And we're going to fly down and visit him. Looking back at the calendar, I see that I left on a Saturday. And then I flew back a week later on a Sunday. Now, it would be the longest flight I'd ever taken to date, about five and a half to six hours each way with one fuel stop. I thought that the four of us should fly together in a rented 182, but my wife thought it was better if she flew commercial both ways and for me to fly down to Arizona with one of my daughters, the six-year-old, and then for me to fly back to California a week later with my three-year-old. 
Now, the trip down was relatively uneventful, though this was before the days of GPS, and I planned my route using VORs. And for my last leg, I planned to fly along a radial for about 80 miles, and then at a particular DME distance, around 80 miles out, turn south to land at Scottsdale. Now, imagine my surprise at perhaps 60 miles out, I lost the DME signal, and it was getting dark. I was talking with Phoenix Approach, but they were busy, and in my descent, I got below the radar coverage, and they terminated my flight following. Now, I was really in a bind at that point. What I didn't realize was that there were some tall mountains just north of Scottsdale, and I had descended below them, and I was without any reliable navigation source to continue on to the Scottsdale airport. Now, fortunately, and this part was totally luck, the lights of Phoenix provided just enough backlighting for me to see the tops of the mountains. So I discovered they were there because of that backlighting, and I climbed above them and landed without incident. Now, on the return trip, I dealt with continually rising clouds, and I found myself as high as 13,500 feet occasionally dipping back down to 12,500 feet since I could only stay at 13.5 for a maximum of 30 minutes to comply with the FAA's oxygen rules. Well, eventually, I found myself stuck at 13,500 feet, and it was for more than 30 minutes because of the rising clouds below me. Now, I could have flown IFR at a lower altitude, but I wanted to stay on top of the clouds to minimize the turbulence. And as I was north of Bakersfield, California, I'd been flying for just about four hours, when I saw the most amazing wall of black clouds in front of me that I'd ever seen. Now, the clouds looked like they went up nearly twice my height, so I'd estimate the tops were above 26,000 feet. And so I knew that within perhaps 10, 15 minutes, I'd be penetrating that wall of clouds about halfway up. And my reasoning at the time reflected that of a pilot who had relatively few hours, even though I'd been flying for more than 15 years. I figured that I had an instrument rating, and this is just what it was intended for, flying in the clouds. Boy, how naive could I have been? But today, if I were in the same situation, saw that same wall of clouds, man, I'd make a U-turn. I'd go back, land at Bakersfield, spend the night there in a hotel, and come home on Monday. But at the time, I never even thought of that as an option. Instead, I had a crying three-year-old sitting next to me, and I may have been slightly hypoxic from flying along at 13,500 feet for so long, and even though I'd read for years about the dangers of get there itis, and I was thoroughly convinced that I could never possibly succumb to it, well, as I've said many times, never underestimate the power of a crying three-year-old. I mean, that just totally clouded all of my judgment, and all I could think of at the time was, I've got to get home, I've got to get home, and that is the classic description of get there itis. Anytime you feel that you must press on, because you have a meeting tomorrow, or because you think your passengers might be disappointed, or because you have a big weekend planned, watch out, because you may be setting yourself up for an accident. Now, in my case, I got my IFR clearance. I was given an altitude of 14,000 feet, and eventually I reached the wall cloud. And I remember prior to reaching the wall, the crosswind angle I needed to fly changed considerably, and it shifted a lot to the left, which is one sign that you're approaching a low-pressure area, as I would have been since I was approaching a storm. Now, I penetrated the wall at 14,000 feet, and I kept my eyes glued on the instrument. This 182 had no autopilot. Of course, the autopilots available in G aircraft back then were pretty lousy anyway and wouldn't have been able to handle the turbulence in clouds. Fortunately, today's autopilots, they're much better. And if I were in a cloud today with a modern autopilot, of course I would turn it on. And before I entered the cloud... I didn't even think to check the outside temperature, but at 14,000 feet in March, it shouldn't have been a surprise to me, but it was, that I was above the freezing level. So I started picking up ice, and I told ATC that I needed lower. They stepped me down to 12,000 feet, and I told them that I needed lower. So they stepped me down to 10,000 feet, and I told them in a fairly urgent voice that I still needed lower. From there, they stepped me down in 1,000-foot increments, and at 7,000 feet, which was the MEA for that segment, the ice started coming off the airplane. So it was just total dumb luck that the ice started coming off at the MEA. If the temperature had been even just a couple of degrees colder, I really think I would have iced up and crashed because I had get there itis so badly that never once in that incident did I ever even consider making a 180 degree turn, which of course is what I should have done when I first encountered the ice. So, that kind of begs the question, how do you know when you've got get-there-itis, and what do you do about it? 
This comes from the FAA's ALC-25, the Flight Review Prep Guide, and I'll provide a link to this in the show notes. In this section of it, they talk about external pressures and pushing on. They say at some point in your flying career, you probably got a warning about get there itis. That is because over the years, a number of GA accidents have been associated with external or social pressures, such as the pilot's reluctance to appear cowardly or to disappoint passengers eager to make or continue a trip. There is almost always pressure on the pilot to launch and pressure to continue. Even the small investment in making the trip to the airport can create pressure to avoid wasted time. Factors that can affect you include someone waiting at the airport, fear of disappointing friends or family, desire to demonstrate pilot qualifications, example, an instrument rating, desire to impress someone, desire to satisfy a personal goal, and a pilot's general goal completion orientation. And learning to resist these external pressures is vital to safe flying. Now, under a section called Pushing Back, they say, here are some ways to push back against pressure to push on. Develop personal minimums that will help you make the toughest go, no-go, and continue divert decisions well in advance of any specific flight. Let your passengers know that safety is your top priority. Manage passenger expectations right from the start. Show them your personal minimums and tell them up front that you will not launch or continue in conditions that do not meet your pre-established minimums. Know what pressures are driving them and develop alternatives, such as airline tickets, hotel rooms, rental cars, before you start the trip that will relieve anxiety for both you and your passengers. Advise anyone meeting you that your plans are flexible. Establish reality check checkpoints along the route at which you will evaluate conditions before pressing on. If possible, have an alternative in mind for every 25 to 30 nautical mile segment of your flight. Know in advance what conditions will trigger a diversion. Remind yourself and others that one of the most effective tools you have is waiting. Of course, that's waiting on the ground. Now, bad weather rarely lasts more than a day or two. In fact, I'll just mention as an aside, often you'll hear that pilots crash in bad weather, but the funeral is held on a beautiful, clear day, which means really if you just waited a day or two, you could have been flying in that beautiful, clear day. Now, they also include links here, and I'll include these in the show notes, to the personal minimums checklist. And also, they say additional information and a complete explanation on the use of the PAVE checklist can be found in the Personal and Weather Risk Assessment Guide. Now, here's a short list of my personal red flags. Let's talk about these. Long trips, for example, three hours or longer, especially if that's the longest trip you've ever done, that should be a red flag for you. In fact, for those kinds of things, you might want to consult with a CFI to get some good advice prior to launching on that trip. Here's another red flag, a long trip in an aircraft type that is new to you that you've just gotten checked out in. Now, that's especially true if you just bought your dream airplane and you're bringing it home. I once did a search of the NTSB database on phrases like recently purchased, and I was surprised by the large number of accidents that occur when pilots are flying their new plane home or that occur within just a few weeks after they get that nice new plane home. Here's another red flag, trip planned long time in advance, because you'll tend to be more committed to going forward with it, even if the conditions are marginal. Another red flag, professional meetings, because you might feel that you have to be there. Another red flag, passengers who are important to you that you might worry about disappointing, and these could be family, business coworkers, or clients. Another red flag, the weekend trip where you have to be home in time for a Monday morning meeting. And let me wrap up with a story of a pilot who'd had his private for just a couple of months. He flew from Fresno to the San Martin airport for a weekend. On Sunday night, he told people that he, quote, had to be in Fresno on Monday. Now, remember that phrase, had to be in Fresno on Monday. And against the advice of local pilots, he took off at night when there were clouds that were below the level of the mountains between San Martin and Fresno. After taking off, he realized his mistake and he was getting flight following from NorCal approach, but unfortunately, he crashed and died before he could get back to San Martin after realizing the error that he made. So let me point out where that pilot was wrong. He said he had to be in Fresno on Monday, but here's where he was wrong. Monday came, and not only was he not in Fresno, he was no longer alive. So anytime you're telling yourself that you have to be somewhere at a certain time, certain date, <laughs> you are wrong. You do not have to be there. 
So please, please, please look for the warning signs of get there itis. And anytime you start to feel some self induced pressure and you're telling yourself that you have to fly in spite of poor flying conditions, remember these words. Sometimes it's just better to be late in this world than to rush into the next world. And I'll be right back right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And one more thought on Get There Itis, and this actually is a connection with the Apollo Space Program. I ran across an interview on NPR.org. They'd interviewed a couple of engineers who were involved in the program. And in the article it was written, it's not that people didn't think something could go wrong. It's just that before January 27th, 1967, nothing major had, certainly nothing on such a catastrophic scale. During a routine launch rehearsal test of what was scheduled to be the first manned Apollo mission, that was Apollo 1, a spark set off an all-consuming fire in the pure oxygen environment of the module. The hatch couldn't be opened quickly enough, and the cockpit full of flammable materials was quickly engulfed. The three astronauts inside were killed. Now, they have an interview with Chuck Lowry. He was an expert in parachutes, and he was one of the nearly 400,000 people who worked on the space program in the 1960s. He said, quote, Our feeling about the lunar mission took on a whole new dimension of increased safety, he said. I think in the beginning, before the fire, before 1967, we were very pressed by schedule. We did everything to meet schedules. And when you do that, you're apt to miss details that could be very important. You don't know it at the time. And I've read elsewhere that some people think we never would have made it to the moon without the Apollo 1 disaster because that forced the program to take a step back, refocus on all their processes, refocus on safety. And it was because of that new focus that they were able to be successful. Well, it's that time, so if you're interested in buying any model of Cirrus airplane or jet or interested in flight training in one, please contact me today. Pick up the phone. Call me now. You can reach me at 650-967-2500. Happy to talk with you about the ins and outs of buying new versus used, but call me early in that process before you even get started on that. You can also reach me at my website, aviationnewstalk.com. Just click on contact at the top of the page. And by the way, you can also use that page to leave any listener questions or give us feedback. And I want to thank everybody who sends me listener questions and feedback. I'm just sorry that we've run long here and I'm not able to include them in this show, but we'll do that on the next news show. Finally, if you would take a moment, tell your aviation friends how they can find the Aviation News Talk podcast. So that would really help us out because we're constantly trying to figure out how do we get more people to learn about Aviation News Talk. And most of the way we do that is through you. So please take a moment, think about what friend of yours could really benefit from this if they're not familiar with how to get a podcast, then just show them how to download our dedicated app in the App Store. Either go in the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, search for Aviation News Talk, and you'll have our dedicated app for free. And of course, if you want to support us on either Patreon, go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, or support us through PayPal at aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. 